students of Musa Student Society of Nigeria MSN National Headquarters, which comprise the balance sheet as of 31st March 2018 and the income statement as well as other explanatory notes, which have been prepared under the accounting policy set out on uh, page what? Page 11. Oh, no, sorry. Because of the, as at the time of the report, the pages of those statements will not be asserted. So therefore, that, that's why the page is empty. So the report starts from page 35. It is my responsibility as a national author of this noble society to form an independent opinion based on the audit and to report my opinion to you. Basis of opinion. I cannot do this in accordance with the international standards on auditing, that is the NSAs, and those that are required that I comply with ethical requirements and plan, plan and perform the audit of, uh, to obtain reasonable assurance as to whether the financial statement is approved for material misstatements. An audit includes examination on a text basis of evidence relevant to the amount and disclosures in the financial statement. It also includes an assessment of the universal judgment made by the financial secretary in the preparations of the financial statements and of whether accounting policies are appropriate to the MSS circumstances, consistently applied and adequately disclosed. I plan and perform the audit audits in order to obtain all information and extensions which I consider necessary to provide me with sufficient evidence to give reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatements. Informing my opinion, I also evaluate the overall adequacy of the presentations of the information in the financial statement. I have obtained all the information and explanations I consider necessary for the purpose of the audit. In my opinion, thorough books of accounts have been kept by the financial state secretary of the society, and the financial statement is in agreement with the book of accounts. Opinion. In my opinion, and to the best of information and the explanation given to me, the financial statement, together with the relevant notes, give a true and fair view of the financial positions of the MSN as of 31st March 2018, which is the latest one, and of its financial performance for the year ended in accordance with national financial reporting standard of the current, uh, the latest year. We have the reports in three phases. The first phase was 2016, ended March. Second phase was uh, the one that ended in 2017, the same year, financial year end. Uh, the last one was, uh, which is the current one, of course, that will fill our two positions and um, performance as well. So, in view of that, uh, I have, in my opinion, as I said other time, to the best of, my, of the information and the explanations given to me, the financial statements, together with the relevant notes, give a true and fair view of financial positions of the MSSN as of 31st March 2018, and of its financial performance for the year ended, and that is the income statement for the year ended uh, 2018 as well, March, in accordance with the international financial reporting standards, which have replaced the normal statement of accounting standard that we use locally initially. So signed by me, Shitu uh, Gekwa Said, as a national auditor. And uh, regarding the issue raised of uh, disclosures of certain items or not disclosing certain items, uh, well, it is not in our practice just like I've met it, that uh, receipts and payments accounts are part of the final account. I don't know. Probably we have people who have opinion regarding that. Financial, final account that is meant for presentations are five in other areas. And what is important there is the income as uh, expenditure account in a commercial uh, enterprise or commercial, uh, uh, what do you call it? 
in a setup that is profit oriented, they call it profit and loss account. So the balance sheet is common because though it's now called the statement of financial positions as far as IFRS is concerned, or even in the public sectors where the international public standard accounting standards are also adhered to currently. So the preparation of receipts and formats are the first line, uh, we call it a uh, first book of entry in account. It is the first book of entry that records all your receipts and your payments. And it's the same thing as cash book, it's not as, not as set up. So those items are not being part, even people who do simple uh, bookkeeping or accounting will know that when you are asked to prepare final account, your cash book or your receipt and payment are not part of the financial final account. They are the basis, they are the sources of you getting the final account, and that is income and, and uh, expenditure or profit and loss account as the case may be. So preparing receipt and payment account is the basis for which even whoever wants to check the account to use as the basis of checking those, the two statements of three, the notes included that are prepared here. And to capital, that has been the usual practice, at least for the past uh, three, three uh, maybe regime, maybe? But, so I don't know if people raise any issue. But even if we are to raise any issue, I think the issue is to be raised فسبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته once again um, It is indeed a very great honor and privilege to be here with you in this all important occasion to discuss a very important topic of this kind discussing about the MSSN and the intricacies of studentship in Islam um, quite unfortunately, the chairman of this occasion is supposed to have been the person who is uh, to be delivering this lecture, being my very great scholar. I have known him for very quite some time, a very respected personality, and I believe the choice of him being the national imam is a very good one. And uh, unfortunately, to speak before him is not really, uh, it's really a big deal and a very great task. But the fortunate thing is that I am very much sure if I happen to make any mistake, he is obviously going to correct it indeed, and he will put all of us through, not me alone. Uh, so I'm in the safe hands, I believe. Um, this kind of topic is supposed to have been discussed by somebody who is quite scholarly uh, in terms of the Islamic knowledge, Islamic concept, Islamic ideology, Islamic philosophy, as well as somebody who is equally vast as an educationist in the, in the educational philosophy. But unfortunately, I am neither of these. But all the same, I could be able to pick from different sources that are available at my disposal to be able to deliver as much as I could on the expected topic. As I have said, the topic is the MSSN and the intricacies of studentship in Islam. Um, to discuss on this topic, of course, something is failing, please, sorry. Um, in the presentation as a form of uh, introduction per se, I've decided to discuss about the MSSN in the first slide, even though I have not intended to discuss extensively about MSSN because all of you are aware of what MSS is, how is it established. But as a sort of a reminder, we should be able to note by highlighting the fact that the Muslim Student Society of Nigeria, the most encompassing Islamic organization as far as I know in Nigeria, 
was founded on the 18th of April 1954, as we, all, we are all aware. And uh, this was made in response to the earnings of Muslim students for a platform to discuss and find solutions to their common problems and challenges, especially in the face of hostile colonial and evangelical environment then prevalent in the country. This, as was reported in the MSSN website of Lagos State Lagos University. And the organization has continued to adapt and respond to the changing challenges and needs of its members and the Nigerian Muslim community in general. And it is in line with this, the MSSN happens to have one of its mandates, one of its major objectives, one of its aim is to inculcate moral behavior in the minds of all Muslim students. And to be able to do that, education happens to be one of the bases. Are you sure this is working? Okay. Education is basically one of the basis of inculcating moral attributes to Muslim students. And it is in line with this, I believe, studentship is there for the lifelong process in Islam generally and in MSSN in particular. And this uh, is actually what gave rise to the choice of this topic. And not only that, he said, even in the context of uh, the Western ideology, education and learning is a lifelong process, not only in the Islamic perspective. And we'll be able to highlight on that considering the concepts of education in the modern times. And therefore, Islam being a comprehensive religion deals with the entire lifespan of the human life. Whatever concept that is attributed to the life of the Muslim is encompassed within the Islamic mission. This phase of life could be the faith or the belief in the oneness and unity of Allah, believing in his attributes, believing in his names, and putting such into practice as always in the human life, believing in angels, prophets, messengers, the books, etc., etc., Worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through different modes of worship prescribed and instructed in the Holy Quran as well as in the authentic traditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As well as social interaction between all communities, social interaction between individuals, so personal and interpersonal relationship as well between communities, between families, between neighbors, between students and learners, etc., except between learners and educators, etc., etc., all are encompassed within the Mu'amalat description of the Islamic perspective. And therefore, this means, by implication, Islam covers the entire life. And the aim of this Islam is to establish the ideal human society and the brotherhood, supreme general benevolence and the divine guidance among men for their betterment and salvation. And to be able to do that, there must be knowledge, there must be education, there must be teaching, there must be instruction, there must be training, and at some point, there even must be indoctrination. To just believe in the holy book as a revealed source of guidance, believe in it, no matter what, would have to be given a certain level of the conception of indoctrination because you have to believe in it the way it is, especially in the aspect of belief or tawheed. Now, to enable you to accomplish all this, you need knowledge. And therefore, the primary asset of an ideal worker who is a Muslim is he would have to have knowledge. This knowledge primarily, if you are considering the primary sources, would have to come from the Quranic verses, both in terms of content and context, the authentic hadith or prophetic traditions of the Prophet wasallam, as well as Islamic literature. These three issues will constitute the sources expected of every Muslim to deduce the Islamic knowledge from. And from the basis of this knowledge, it is expected that every Muslim would have to have a level of Iman, faith, 
or the takwa, which is Allah's consciousness. This is for the fact that you have to believe in the primary source we have described the earlier on where you happen to deduce all the knowledge expected in terms of the Islamic mission. You have to believe in the Quran, you have to believe in the Hadith, and believing in them would have to make, you, make it necessary upon you to abide by its illustrations, its injunctions, its commandments, its principles, its ideology, and you have to accept all the concepts embedded in it. And therefore, by doing so, you are going to abide by Allah's principles, laws, regulations, principles, and injunctions. As long as you do that, you become uh, of high level of Allah's consciousness. And with that, you don't just believe, you don't just understand, you don't just comprehend, you don't just read or write, you don't just have the knowledge, you don't just educate yourself, you don't just teach somebody, you don't just undergo the learning process, but you equally have to put it into practice. Therefore, you have the aman, which is the deeds. Out of which, it is expected of you to have some level of attributes, like humility. You need to be conducting not only the compulsory prayers, but even including the night prayers, for example. Remembrance of Allah, the dhikr. In fact, spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To mention but very few, in addition to the compulsory deeds, that you are supposed to abide by from the aforementioned of believing in Allah as well as deducing from the Quran and the Sunnah as well as the Islamic literature in terms of knowledge. And this is what is expected of every Muslim. Now, when you consider general education in Islamic perspective, which is the basic issue of the discussion, you realize that you have three basic elements involved. You have the teacher, you have the student and you have the knowledge itself, which is the transfer between, is the transferred element between the teacher and the learner, or the student. The student is basically the learner. Now, these three elements constitute the philosophy of teaching learning process elements, the elements or the components of teaching and learning. Now, in, in Islam, learning is basically a means of worshipping God, an aspect of ibadah because there is no way you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without understanding who is Allah, believing in his unity and all related attributes, as well as understand the mode of the worship expected of you to abide by. And therefore, one of the basic essence of these elements that constitute the philosophy of knowledge in Islam is that you should be able to understand how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the consideration is given to the next life to be the most important phase of human existence. It means your concern is not just the worldly life, but what can you deduce in the worldly life to be able to have an eternal life. <coughs> and that is the basic essence. Therefore, we could say, when we are talking of general objectives, we want to discuss the mission. If you want to identify the goal of the Islamic knowledge, search for education, learning process, it is basically for you to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know the mode of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of the knowledge, the skills, as well as the attributes or the behavior. And then finally, to consider the eternal life while you are here in this world. Now considering this, we want to now move on to understand that education is of a paramount importance as far as Islam is concerned. And uh, this has been emphasized in different Quranic verses, as well as in so many prophetic, authentic traditions. But to consider a verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُولِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا وَجَعْلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَةِ وَالْأَبْصَارَةِ وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ It is He, the Lord, who brought you out of your mother's womb without knowing anything. When you came as an infant, you don't know anything per se. All your human faculties are almost non-functional. You don't have any intellectual reasoning. You cannot do any analytical thinking. You cannot perform any reflex movement that is expected to be by training or by basic uh, reflex movement, 
the only movement you can do is the reflex movement as a result of stimuli. Beside this, you couldn't do any other thing. So you don't have anything. There is no faculty of reasoning. And that was why Allah says, He brought you out while you don't have anything. You are almost empty in terms of knowledge and intellectualism. But for the fact that Allah has made you, He has given you some sensory organs that you could hear, you could see, you could reason, you should understand that He has made you so many favors. So you should be thankful to Him. And this verse tells you that these are the three basic sensory organs and faculties that provides you with better reasoning, better intellectual faculty, better analytical thinking, and that is where the basic concept of education or teaching and learning is based upon. And therefore we say, see, the faculties mean the use of hearing that provides you an evidence of collecting information and data, seeing that provides you with an evidence of observation, and thinking that drives you into new results. Now these three issues will take you into uh, what we may term as scientific experimentation research. Or in other words, intellectual analysis. Or in other words, critical reasoning and thinking. Now these issues will help you to do that. Additionally, knowledge encompasses the three basic issues. Learning, I mean, there is the knowledge itself, the knowledge is nothing more rather than mere collection of data, information, ideas, and stuff like that. But beside that, you need skills. The skills is what is expected of you that will help you to be able to put issues into practice. The knowledge could be able to be practiced ideally. And then lastly, but not the least, not only having the concept of the knowledge, not only the information and the data, not only the skills expected, then you are equally expected to have some level of attitude. Now these three issues are what constitutes knowledge. And that is why even in the Western ideology of philosophy, they tell you that philosophy constitutes what they call metaphysics. Um, metaphysics is about the living, eternal life, God, supernatural being, etc., etc., and then you have issues that has to do with axiology. Axiology is something about attitude, about attribute, about behavior, about values, norms, culture, etc., etc. And we equally have the other aspect that deals with the actual knowledge. Words, concepts, ideas, understandings, comprehension, etc., etc. Now these faculties drive you onto that and could be deduced from this verse. And whichever group excels in using it, becomes the leader, especially when Muslims do not follow Islam. By using these three faculties, you become extraordinary. You can become intellectually stable. You will have a very good faculty of reasoning. And you can have vast knowledge, you can have all the expected skills, you can have all levels of intelligence to a particular point, and you can have the attributes, the moral behavior, the moral conduct, the attitude expected of you. And once you have these qualities put all together, you realize that whether consciously or unconsciously, you tend to be a leader wherever you find yourself because of these faculties. Now, additionally, the first revelation of the Quran testifies to the importance of knowledge in Islam. It says, Ikra bi rabbika khalaq, insan, من على إقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. You can see that in five places underlined, knowledge was emphasized within this verse. Ikra is about knowledge. Ikra وربك الأكرم about knowledge. الذي علم بالقلم. Even the means of getting the knowledge was identified here. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم twice in the same verse. This emphasizes the necessity of knowledge. Five words on learning in the first five verses. Revealed in an age which was not information age. You call this age ICT age, right? 
Information and Communication Technology Inc. When this verse was revealed, there was nothing as such. In fact, you could say the age seems to be something like a stone age or a bit better than that. It could be somehow a machine age to some level, but a very primitive level per se. In a society of Umiyun, these verses were revealed. We have extremely few knew how to read and write, very few. To an extent that even when you go for jihad, it will be one of the measures to take if you want to improve the teaching and learning process that some of those who were captured in the jihad could be eliminated from the bond of slavery if they are able to accept it to teach some of our Muslim, Muslim brothers what they actually know. That was the extent of it. And then the Prophet himself was on me. And these verses were reviewed, emphasizing knowledge. It is of paramount importance. And not only that, Allah says, Yerfa Allah, Ladina Amadu Minkum, Ladina Utul Elma, Darajat, not Daraja. Those who happen to be knowledgeable among you, those who have secured some learning process, those who have intellectual understanding, those who could comprehend the concept of education, are provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with some degrees above others. Degrees, not just a degree, but degrees. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out of supplication to be saying repeatedly, Wa qul rabbi zidni ilma. O Lord, increase me in knowledge. O Lord, increase me in knowledge. Now, to emphasize this, the Prophet's role as an educator is enough to tell you that education is of utmost importance. وَالَّذِي بَعْثَ فِي الْأُمَّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَتَلُّوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُذَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ذَلَالِ مُبِينَ they were ignorant before. They don't know anything. They are empty in terms of knowledge. But Allah brought up this prophet from among them who doesn't know neither how to read nor how to write. But he brought it upon them so that you could be reciting the Quran to them. Yet lu alayhim ayatihi. And not only that, he also purifies them by telling them, teaching them moral behaviors moral conduct, good attributes, giving them better background in terms of how to behave and relate to well in terms of social interaction. And he teaches them the book and he teaches them wisdom. These are the rules of the Prophet in terms of knowledge. And this tells you by extension that these are supposed to be the rules of the ulama. Therefore, in the verse, two rules were mentioned. Recite the verses, do tafkia, purify their life from negative and enhance good qualities, teach them the book, teach them the hikmah or the wisdom, and the above four are the real areas of education in Islam. It is not just delivering information. That is not enough. You don't just gather the information, you utilize the information. You comprehend the information. You analyze the information. You reflect upon the information. Then you conduct yourself based on the information gathered from the raw data exhibited. And this is what is expected. Now, information or knowledge, or much more? No, not just the information, not just the knowledge, but you need more. You tell this much about Yesha. It is, not just, it is not just about gathering the data. It's not about data collection. You see, even in the modern, modern search methodology, it is expected of you that when you are conducting a research, you don't just collect the data and leave it as such, isn't it? After collecting the data, you need to analyze the data. You need to interpret the data, and then you bring out outcomes from the data. It's the same thing here. You gather the data, you gather the information, but what do you grab out of this data and information is the wisdom. And whoever is provided with such wisdom, verily he was given 
a vast blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the essence of knowledge in Islam. And you could realize that from this, without education, without teaching, without knowledge, without studentship, nothing could exist. Nothing could continue. Everything will perish. And that was why the Prophet sallallahu wasallam said, in the last days to come, knowledge will be wiped away. It doesn't really mean that the knowledge doesn't exist. But those who have the extensive knowledge will be living this life one after another without any replacement. Until one time comes that the world is filled up with those who are purely ignorant. They'll be asked about the questions. They answer the questions ignorantly. They don't know how to differentiate. They don't know how to understand. They don't know how to comprehend. They don't know how to have the wisdom. They don't know how to gather the information. They don't know how to impart the information. They don't know how to inculcate the attitudes and moral behavior. And therefore the knowledge is lost and became, becomes waste. And that tells you that the world is perishing. Because nothing could go. If you want to teach, you have to have knowledge, right? If you want to be a carpenter, you have to learn it. You want to be a mechanic, you have to learn it, right? Whatever you want to do. You want to marry, you have to understand the concept of marriage. And you have to live and abide by the instructions of that concept. Therefore, everything virtually is guided by knowledge. Now, in terms of identifying the classes, categories, and different uh, concepts of knowledge. As far as this discussion is concerned, we could say knowledge is subdivided into two. You have beneficial knowledge and the non-beneficial one. The beneficial, of course, you could be understood from the prayer of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He usually says, "Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'ah." Beneficial. Rabbi zidni ilma. But in some narrations, he equally pray by saying, Allahumma inni a'udhu wika min ilmin la yamfa. It means there is category of knowledge that wouldn't benefit you any at all. It's not beneficial. But as long as it has some benefit, it means you can go for it. But you have to be able to discriminate between what is beneficial and what is non-beneficial. According to some ulama, even the non-beneficial knowledge ought to be understood, otherwise some people will dwell into it without actually identifying that it is non-beneficial. But we have to have some category of people who are well learned to be able to identify the non-beneficial aspect of it and then call upon others, call their attention to that so that they could be able to understand. Now areas of Islamic education therefore, as aforementioned, is about God's wealth that are based on revelation that are called Mankulat, and equally about God's world using the three faculties Allah gave to each one of us by listening, by watching, by using mind, that is Mankulat. Now putting up together the Mankulat and the Mankulat, you become vast in knowledge by identifying the beneficial out of the non-beneficial. And therefore, you gather the items you have identified earlier on in terms of gathering data and information, that will be translated analytically into what you could term as the skills as well as the attitude. Now, comprehensive education, therefore, encompasses about Allah's word, which is direct study, that is the primary, primary source, as well as Allah's word, which is the supporting studies. So from this concept, you could say you have two basic kinds of knowledge. The primary knowledge, which is the knowledge of the revelation the knowledge of the inspiration, the knowledge of the wisdom, while the second one is the supporting study. That supporting study is that which assists you and helps you to be able to succeed in this world that you could utilize to succeed in the hereafter. So this is just supporting. You read engineering, you read law, you read economics, sociology, philosophy, psychology, uh, literature, language, blah, 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 science, medicine, um, physiotherapy, radiology, or um, anatomy, etc., etc. 
all these ones are barely to support you as to the direct study that has to do with the Allah's word. It should be able to guide you to interpret how eternal, uh, to be able to interpret how you could be able to perform to get the eternal life, which is the basic essence as we have discussed earlier on. So analytically we could say the Allah's word given the direct study is basically the Quran with the inclusion of the hadith because you cannot separate the two. You only know the kitab wal hikmah. So you have to have the two. And then in terms of the Allah's world, you have Ayamillah. And you have the Allah's world. You have the God's kingdom. Now all this put together will give you issues like history, culture, science, technology, law, economics, <coughs> languages, arts, etc., etc. And all this encompassed together are only to support you in terms of the direct studies that has to do with the Quran and Hadith or the Allah's word. And that is why the ulama says, whatever you read in this world, as far as you are a Muslim, then you ought to Islamize that concept. This is in line with this, so that I can be able to get up with the Allah's word, the direct study, the Quran and the Hadith, it has to be in line with that. Once they are contradictory, the tendency is that it's either you abandon the study of the supporting world or you abandon the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, drilling into the studentship that is long life, we see now education for all. This implies equality. So he says the Salafiya Dawah constitutes comprehension of the Quran and Sunnah in the best and simple mode so that education can encompass all. It means nobody is exempted in terms of teaching and learning process. That is studentship. Additionally, learning is a, life, a lifelong process. It doesn't have beginning, it doesn't have ending. The psychologist believed that even an embryo within his mother's womb has some level of knowledge, some level of comprehension as per that is in cognizance to his own level, per se. So it doesn't mean that his knowledge starts when he comes to this world, per se. And then it doesn't end. Isn't it? Of course, you search for knowledge until you die. And even after your death, you still see what you don't know. When you get to the paradise, it's something you have never seen, you have never heard of, you have never thought of. It means you never knew that, right? But you are knowing it now, in the eternal life. So therefore, knowledge is a lifelong process. Ibn Abbas, reported a tradition, Imam al-Albani rahimahullah said, this hadith is authentic considering other narrations of its time. Ibn Abbas said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa, wa, alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam says, mafumani la yaqadhi wahidun minhuma nuhmatahu. Manhum ila talab al ilmi la yaqadhi nuhmatahu. Two persons in desperate sack will never be satisfied. The person searching for knowledge, he will never be satisfied. He will be searching for it continuously. In fact, the more you search for it, the more you realize that you need more. And the more you get more, the more you understand more should come. The more as is coming, the more you realize that you have never started. So it's a lifelong process. It doesn't end at all. And then the other person is somebody who is searching for worldly material. Yes. Would you remember the authentic prophetic tradition in Bukhari and Muslim? When the Prophet ﷺ designed a rectangle, right? And he drew diagonally a line bisecting at the middle and extended the edge, right? He said, the width of the rectangle is the lifespan of the humankind. 
What the diagonal line cutting across is his wish, his desire. This is what he wants. It extends even beyond the width of the life. It means even after you, you don't even know that your life is ending, but your desires are getting more and more and more. So you're not being satisfied. Though. These two persons are never satisfied. You believe with me that you see, even in the modern education, in the Western educational system, you see somebody who happens to be a professor, yet he's conducting some research. And there are certain times when you come, you may come with an idea that he never knew. I could remember when I submitted my uh, topics for, as proposal for research for a postgraduate study, I took it to one professor, a very learned professor for that matter in the field. I gave three topics for her to make a choice, a lady. And I was very sure even when I was submitting that she would pick the first topic. You know why? It is a new concept. So when she saw it, she, was, she had to confirm from me, even though she's a professor, I wasn't. Ah, you mean there is this concept? How did you get this topic? Ah, this is how I got it. This is, you mean there is this? Of course there is. She doesn't know, even though she's a professor. That is knowledge. So you can't know it all, no matter what. Now, from this hadith, it is very clear that knowledge is a lifelong process. And therefore, in lifelong learning, you can see how you'll be rising from the ground level upward continuously. And that ladder is endless. It goes on and on and on. You can see a child with a book, right? You can see one that is a bit bigger with a book, you can see youth with a book, and see an old man, still reading. So it is a continuous process. It doesn't end. All of them are happy. Why? Because they are searching for knowledge. One thing with knowledge is the more you gain, the more you get happier. The more you understand, the more you become happier. The more you comprehend, the more you become happier. And so it continues like that, as such, continuously. It was reported that one of the pious predecessors among the Muslim scholars used to give one of his boys a book. That even when he is going into the toilet, he would give the boy a book. See, sit by the door of the toilet. As I will be inside, please read this chapter for me. He is inside the toilet, even himself, yet he feels that if he f finishes that, he does that without reading anything, he's wasting his time. So the boy would, would be reading aloud from outside while he'll be inside even himself listening to that. That is learning, right? Even though he is a very great scholar, but yet he feels he needs to learn more and more. Only that, psychologists have understood that in formal educational setting, there is level of age of a child before he could start comprehending. So if you put him in school before that age, you are wasting your money and resources, uselessly for nothing. And the World, the world Bank Group <laughs> states as follows, a lifelong learning framework encompasses learning throughout the life cycle, <coughs> from birth to grade, and in different learning environments. Formal or informal. And that is why some believed that learning can be divided into formal, informal, and even non-formal. It's a continuous process. It doesn't mean that you only learn when you are in school, in a formal setting of school. You continuously continue learning. Some of you, after graduating, you might have no one to go back to any school setting again. But does that mean that you have stopped learning? You have stopped educating yourself? You have ended up the teaching and learning process? Of course, no. This is a lifelong process. And once you believe and convince yourself that you are through with learning, at a certain level, you have perished. You are gone. You are nowhere. You become nothing. And that is the more reason why it is convincing to you that you are a typical ignorant. As long as you feel such. 
So, <clears throat> lifelong learning is broadly defined as learning that is pursued throughout life. Learning that is flexible, it is diverse, it is available at different times and in different places. Lifelong learning crosses sectors, promoting learning beyond the traditional schooling and throughout adult life, post compulsory education. It means there is a minimum level of education expected of everybody. That is compulsory. Then you have the post compulsory as well, right? At our level now, I don't think we have, been, we have even attained the minimum level of the compulsory education. Not to talk of retiring from learning. Not to talk of going into the post compulsory education. Lifelong learning, why? Learning is education, right? And learning is a natural and continuous process of the brain, actively or passively. So for the lifetime, the brain keeps on learning. When the brain stops functioning, it means the brain is dead, the process of learning or education stops. This is as to the concept of the Western ideology, right? But we believe even in paradise you learn. You have never seen God, right? You have never seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you see him in the paradise. That's additional knowledge, atmosphere, right? On the highest level you could gain. So it doesn't end in life. The common life long learners, if you really want to be in the learning process throughout your lifetime, then you shouldn't give up. You need perseverance. You need patience. You need steadfastness. You have to be steadfast on that. And then you always want to learn more. So question more. Read more. Write more. Understand more. Comprehend more. Analyze more. Think more. Act more. Do more. And you get more. That is expected. Then we decide what we need to learn and how we will learn it. So you set your goal and you plan towards that goal. It is expected that every Muslim should have a goal. He should have a mission. He should have an objective. He should have an end result expected. But don't forget, no matter what your goal is, the end result is the eternal life. And then we are always looking for ways to connect new learning with what we already know. We make connections. And that is why the philosophers call this issue connectionism, right? Or you connect the previous experiences with the present experiences, right? And that provides you with the ability of transfer of knowledge. How do you correlate the knowledge? How do you interpret them? How do you interconnect them? How do you put them together to get a better result? And that is what you do as you continue learning. We give things a goal. We take risk. Life is about risk, isn't it? Whatever you do, you are taking risk. You drive from your place to here, you are taking risk. Even if you don't drive yourself, somebody drives you, you are taking risk. Isn't it? You eat in different restaurants, you are taking risk. Even in your home, you are taking risk. You sleep, you are taking risk because you may not wake up one day. That's risk taken. <laughs> so if you want to learn continuously, you have to agree and accept that you are taking risk. And that, that risk, of course, ought to be taken. And then we think about our learning. So you have to reflect. We take responsibility for our learning, so we become self-motivated. You intrinsically become motivated. Motivation is either internal or external life, right? But there has to be the internal motivation before the external motivation could work that comes as a result of environmental factors. So, we think of lifelong learning as an ongoing process, not a static event. And therefore, you need, knowing the learner is necessary, and that gives you self-awareness if you are referring to yourself, then you need planning for learning, so you need self-management, 
you may need a timetable even for that. Understanding how to learn. So you need to know how to learn. You should be able to have study guidance. You should be able to understand yourself. How do you comprehend better? And then get other ideologies. How do you put them together? Then you evaluate your learning. That is self-monitoring. And then finally, you continue as such. And this cycle continues. That is why you see the arrow. It didn't stop anywhere. It is cyclic. So it is continuous. Now finally, it is evident from the aforementioned that education and learning are lifelong processes in Islam. This is the view held by MSSN, I believe. The modern age systems of learning is in conformity with the concept of learning as lifelong process. And that is why you have distance learning, you have distance education, you have flexible learning, you have electronic learning, you have open learning, all these are to give you a room for continuous learning process. There are so many sites, online sites, that you can be studying continuously. Some of them are even free. You don't have to pay. Some of them you only pay for certification if you need a certificate. Are you after the certificate or after the knowledge? You see, if you are referring to Islam, if you go to like uh, sultan.org, you get so many materials. You carry a lot. And they have Arabic versions, they have English versions. Right? Sites like wakafia.com, you get so many books, either in Arabic or in English, pertaining to Islam. Bookboom.com gives you so many books in different fields of the modern study. You have uh, something like, um, is it drivepdf.net that gives you books in millions in any field you, write, you like. Just get it. So, so many chances we are provided for you to learn. You are always with mobile phone, but unfortunately underutilized. You can do a lot of things. Even the Googling, the usual Googling we do, you need to understand it more. Because you have what we call search engine optimization. That's why you realize sometimes somebody will be looking for things in Google. He will tell you he couldn't find it. It's because you don't know how to find it. But it's there. You need to understand the concept of search engine optimization. How do you optimize what you are looking for? Of course you get it. Somebody came to me and brought a question given to him by a lecturer in the university and has been looking for the material online he couldn't get. I now collected it P, 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 P. You know what happened finally? Even the question itself directly was copied online. Yeah. I brought out the question and I brought out the answer there. <laughs> How did you do it? You think these materials I created in myself? I didn't create it myself. I created some, of course, but some I downloaded them. It depends on how well you can be able to search for what you want. You read about search engine optimization, then you'll be able to get whatever you want on the net. So the concept of continuing professional development also confirms education and training as lifelong process. You know what we call CPD. Even when you are within the working environment, it is expected that you have to be updating yourself, you have to be making yourself relevant always. Technology is changing, and if you are not changing, if you are not flexible, if you are not moving with the technology, time will come where you'll be outdated. Because you're not up to date. So the technology cannot move along with you. You'll be left behind. Now, as Muslims, we should be learning every day. We should be learning every day. Thank you very much. I'm told I have uh, 10 minutes, and I believe I've exhausted the 10 minutes. Unfortunately, I'm able to finish at this point. Um, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu ma'asalam.